She's ignoring me again. This is so frustrating. Why does she have to leave me by myself? I just wanted to do a good thing for her. But wait a minute, I, I know that she cares for me. I know that she loves me. She's not doing this on purpose. I just need to remember that she cares for me. She's here for me. Hey, you're welcome. Um, hey, I just wanted to let you know that everything's fine, but um, I was really excited to bring lunch to you today. And then I kind of had to wait for a while because you were talking to other folks. I started to feel, I guess, a little alone, maybe even ignored. And so, you know, if you could help me out next time to come by a little sooner so we can enjoy this time together. Huh. What did I do this time? Clearly he is still upset. I don't know what he wants me to say. I'm not sure what to do next. I really don't want to be in this moment right now. But I know that he needs to hear from me. I know he doesn't think that I'm a failure. I know that he loves me, and he needs to hear me say that I love him and that it's okay. Okay, so what I hear you saying is that you felt ignored um, because it took me a while to get over here because I was still having that conversation over there. Um, and I really didn't mean to make you feel that way, so I apologize, and I will do um, as much as I can to be better about being where I say I'm gonna be. Wow, that, that was not the response I was expecting. You, you know, now that I think about it, did she really do anything wrong? I, maybe it's something inside of me that's the problem. I, I think I'll talk with Jennifer about that in our next counseling session. Thanks for taking time to share with me, and, um, and we're good. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Wow, if you followed Chris and Tammy down through these last few weeks, they've changed a lot, haven't they? They've grown a whole lot. And even uh, Chris is, uh, I mean, he's figuring out it might be something that he needs to even deal with. But it, because it's a safe place. Laura's going to review for you, if you haven't been here yet, or if you just need a reminder, some of those quick things that we talked about over these last four weeks that de-escalate all of the, the tension, but what we're going to share with you today is the step that transforms relationships. We're calling it Hold Me Tight. It comes from a, a, a little verse in the Bible, Psalm 119, 76 and 77, where the psalmist says to God, oh, love me, and right now, hold me tight, just the way you promised. Now comfort me so I can live, really live. Your revelation is the tune that I dance to. You know, when there is this deep kind of love and this deep kind of connection, even little kids notice it. Listen to what Billy, age four, said. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. I kind of like that. So let's listen for the review, and then let's step into this abundant life in our relationships that God has for us this morning. We've learned a lot over the last several weeks, or at least Mark and I have. I don't yeah. know about you guys, but if you've missed one of those weeks, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to those messages. Each one builds upon the other. You can find all of them at our website, cof.church, but I think it's important that you hear those so you know how it's building, so I encourage you to do that. The first thing we learned is that as human beings, we were created for connection, connection with God and connection with one another. We were designed and made that way. It's in our DNA. And that's why we all feel this God-given desire to be completely known, to be understood, to be accepted, and to be loved. 
We've also learned to identify our attachment styles. We've seen that typically as human beings, we develop one of four attachment styles. They're formed early in life as we relate to our parents or to our primary caregivers, but they still impact our lives as adults, especially when we're dealing in conflict situations, how we respond to that. Those of us with a secure attachment style, we're able to connect on an emotional level and we deal with conflict well and successfully. Those of us with an avoidant attachment style may have trouble connecting on an emotional level sometimes, and we tend to withdraw in a conflict situation or think that we can take care of it and handle it all by ourselves. Those of us with an anxious attachment style um, feel like we need to pursue our partner. We're looking to them to meet our need and we keep pursuing oftentimes in a negative way and then our partner withdraws. We struggle to connect emotionally and we end up, the people that we wanna draw close to us, we push away from us. Those of us that have the fearful attachment style, it comes as a result of hostility from your parent or abuse of any sort or some sort of childhood trauma, and it causes kind of a mix of the avoidant and anxious attachment styles. We've also learned how to practice emotional responsiveness. We used the acronym A-R-E-R to help us remember to be accessible, responsive, and engaged with our partner on an emotional level. We remember that our, all of us are asking those questions, are you with me, are you in this? That's what we're looking for. And when we learn to be emotionally responsive, it lets our partner know that yes, I am. I'm in it with you. We've also identified the damaging communication patterns we get into. Remember the deadly dances that Mark talked about? Once we figure out our normal deadly dance, then we have the ability and the opportunity to make a choice to do something different. The blame boogie. <laughs> it's that deadly cycle where we're casting blame, we're attacking one another, accusing one another. It's saying it's your fault, not mine. It's you, not me. The protest polka is probably the most common. It's trying to get your partner to respond in some sort of way, but using a negative way to do so. It's one partner reaching out in a negative way, the other partner feels threatened, and they step back. They see their partner as needy or anxious, and it keeps in this cycle, reaching out and pulling back, reaching out and pulling back. And then there's the withdrawal waltz, where after years maybe of one of the other cycles, they end up in this one where both partners are shut down. They're in self-defense mode. They're trying to protect themselves or they're in denial, trying to act like they don't feel anything and they don't need anyone. We all end up in these deadly cycles. We talked about recognizing the raw spots, those particular sensitivities that we all have that can cause us in a moment to just flare up emotionally. We have to learn to recognize what those raw spots are in us and in our partners and be able to communicate and talk about that so that we don't flare up in that way and we have the opportunity to choose our response on an emotional level. One of the biggest things we've learned to do is simply to slow down, to slow down. Our natural physical response when we feel threatened in any way, whether it's physical or emotional, is that fight or flight response. Our adrenal system kicks into gear, our heart rate jumps up, our breathing rises, our muscles tense, and when we're in that position, there's no way we're gonna have an effective communication on an emotional level with our partner. So we have to learn to slow down. Jen Uherrick, one of Community of Faith's licensed counselors, taught us how to breathe. Do you remember that? And when we take the time to breathe in that way, this simple action slows down our body's physical re response. The adrenal system shuts down. We're able to lower our heart rate, to lower that emotion that we're feeling, to loosen those muscles, and be able to look below the surface and change our perspective. We're not threatened. Our partner's not out to get us. I can think to myself when I'm in this lowered state, Mark loves me. <clears throat> He just wants to connect with me. I want to connect with him. Maybe I hit a raw spot or maybe he hit one in me and then I can choose to be emotionally responsive and engage with him and have a productive conversation. 
Last weekend, Wes taught us about the importance of intentionality, simply taking a seat at this table, making space and room for one another, times to focus our energy and intention on one another so we can have those communications, those emotional connections. We have to remind ourselves in every conflict situation, in those moments when we feel disconnected, our partner is just an adult child, right? Trying to reach out and connect with us. We have to tell ourselves the truth. Securely attached couples do these things. They have learned to accept their partner's attachment protests and provide that safe place, like we saw with Chris and Tammy, to share those emotions and share those feelings. And when we do these things, then we're able to step into the deeper level in our relationships. And that's the goal, secure attachment in our relationships. The first steps are crucial because they de-escalate the situation. And then we're able to step in to a deeper connection with one another. But all of those steps, they're, they're just um, preliminary, all right, to this step that we're getting ready to talk about. Their preparation for this one. Hold me tight it is like a bridge that connects two separate realities. Did you know that you and your significant other, you live in separate realities? Yes, there's an absolute truth out here somewhere, but you don't always see it from your perspective, and they don't always see it from their perspective. And so, Laura and I, we think so differently. And so many times we put things in that gap between us that cause all kinds of turmoil. So what we want to do is bridge that gap so that we can actually understand what each other is, is thinking. And stepping aside from our childish ways that Paul says put away those childish things in that great love chapter, stepping aside from them can be super painful because we've used them to survive, to protect us. Like I want to say to every one of you, congratulations, you're a survivor. You made it through some of those difficult years. Maybe growing up was really difficult in your family of origin. And a lot of people would have just curled up into a little ball and died, but you survived. But those things, those childish things are not serving you now in your relationship. And so Paul says, let's put those away and let's learn how to deal with this. Let's have an adult marriage. Let's figure out what this looks like. And the reason for this risk, it's simple. If we don't take it, we'll forever be alone, even in relationships with others. No one will really know us. We'll never be fully known. We'll never really fully know another. So let's get down to it. Hold me tight really has two parts, two questions. Pull out those sermon notes if you haven't got them already and write these down. The first, what am I most afraid of? What am I most afraid of? What we're doing here, we're taking the elevator down into your emotions. We're going past those childish defenses that you have, and we've got to go all the way to the ground floor. Now, here's the thing. Some of you have never been to the ground floor yet, all right? You've never been there. You don't even know what the ground floor looks like. We talk about people all the time. Their elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. Maybe yours doesn't go all the way to the bottom, all right? Now, don't point at anybody, all right? But we've got to get down underneath some of this to what our real feelings are. And let me just, so I'm going to give you an example of a real life counseling situation. I'm just going to call them husband and wife, no names, okay, to figure out what am I most afraid of. So just listen to how it goes. Husband stares at the floor and sighs. I just want to keep everything under control. I, I get overwhelmed when she gets so upset, especially with me, and I start to feel lost. I don't know what to do. The counselor asks, and what is the biggest catastrophe that could happen here? What are you most afraid of? Husband thinks for a minute, and he says, I don't know, the word shattered keeps coming up in my head. If I, I stay and listen to my wife and the things that she's feeling about me and my failures, and I just feel like I will be shattered. I, I will lose control. This explosion will kill us. So what we have to do, see, is start with the identifying emotion, not even the words that are coming out. So as the counselor asks the husband, what is that 
emotion. What is it? It's fear, isn't it? There's a fear here. There's a fear of being shattered. There's a fear of not being able to handle this. And so the counselor then asks, so what is this fear saying to you? The husband replies, I've tried so hard, but what I know how to do doesn't work. The more I try to get her to be reasonable, the worse it gets. So I feel helpless, really helpless. You see, I'm good at everything I do, but this, I'm not good at her. I don't know how to do this. I can't figure this out. And then he turns to his wife and he says, I never feel sure of myself with you and I need that. I feel, I feel very sad if I don't have you. And then he begins to weep. And then she starts to cry. What's happened here? Husband has gone all the way to the ground floor, to the deeper emotions. Instead of his usual, she's yapping at him, she's pushing at him, she's trying to connect, but she's not doing it well. He just shuts down. That's his normal way. Or else he judges her and says she's unreasonable and emotional and all of these different kinds of things. But he's gone beyond that, he's gone below that. And he's shaping a message out of his emotional turmoil of connection. Now, how his wife responds at this point is critical because oftentimes in counseling in unhappy relationships, when one person takes a risk and opens up, the other partner doesn't see it or, or they're afraid to really trust it. And I, I've heard partners just dismiss uh, the new steps of a husband or wife toward them by saying, well, that's ridiculous or yeah, we'll wait and see how long that lasts, stuff like that. And can I just tell you that that'll spin you right back into the deadly dances. The truth is, this is the truth. No one takes the chance that the husband just took in this scenario without the other person really mattering. No one would be that vulnerable. No one would go that deep. The wife needs to hear you matter to me no matter how unsafe it's been in the past sometimes when you're the partner that's being vulnerable you just have to be willing to hang in there for a moment and realize you haven't been a safe place and and, and it's going to take a while for your significant other to begin to to trust that that this is real and to see you in this different way why finally says, I never knew I mattered enough to you to hurt you that much. I respect you for doing this kind of sharing. It makes me feel closer to you. And then it's the wife's turn to kind of unpack her emotions and see if husband can stay engaged with her. Listen to her words. When you came home, I, I told you I was upset and you said, now don't get all crazy on me. And then he said, if my outbursts didn't stop, you might just have to leave. That was the bottom for me. When you said that you would leave because I was so unreasonable. The husband at this point looks really worried and looks at the counselor and says, I don't know how to make this better. The counselor says really quickly, you don't have to fix anything. Okay, let me just stop and say that again. Husbands, you don't have to fix anything. This is real important to hear. You don't have to fix anything. We're fixers. We like to fix. I'm going to fix her, you know? Women can do that too. I mean, that's when you get married, you know, you walk down the aisle and you come to the altar and usually at the end you'll sing a hymn and that's what she's thinking the whole time. I'll alter him, you know? <clears throat> that was a long stretch. But we do that, don't we, sometimes? The wife just needs to know you're here with her. She needs to know you're with her in her pain. So the wife continues. If I'm sad or, or scared or upset with you, you just turn off like a switch. You don't comfort me. And now we don't 
even make love. You don't hold me either. And just when I need you, it's like you go off in your disapproval. You turn away and discard me. I'm not the wife you want. It can be really hard to listen as a counselor to a wife's abandonment. But you see, they've both expressed now their fears. Fear of shattering, fear of abandonment. So the second part is this. What do I need most from you? This is the second part of hold me tight. Now this is crucial. It's the tipping point encounter. You see, fear and longing are two sides of the same coin. And the second part of hold me tight involves directly stating what your significant other can do to show you they care right now. What do I need most from you? And this is a great leap of faith for those of us who've had little experience of real safety with others. So why would you do it again? Because we long for connection. And remaining defended and isolated is a sad and empty way to live. And not only that, the truth is, No matter how you've been acting with each other, you love each other. And this is how God meant for us to show it. The author, a nice nin, expresses the idea, I think, beautifully. Put that up on the screen. And the day came when the risk to remain tight in the bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. This is where some of you are right now. You're going like, I can't keep going like this anymore and this is this morning is God showing you where to go and it's it looks painful it looks risky doesn't it but you're hurting so badly that it's like I'm gonna I'll I'll do anything at this point you know and that's just God wants us to take that risk God allows the pain so we will get unstuck So we'll grow. But it's scary. I remember year one at Community of Faith, Goodson Middle School. We had our first ever barbecue and all church kind of like picnic, watching the Texans play. And I had just spoken. There's several hundred people out there. I went back behind the curtain of the stage at Goodson and put on this Texan mask that was like a full head mask, you know, and it was kind of split down the middle with the colors of the Texans, and I put my mic on after it, and I was going to, I had this great plan from the beginning, I was going to run out and say, are you ready for some barbecue? So I jumped out from behind the, you know, the curtain after all the last prayer, and I said, are you ready for some barbecue? Unfortunately, with the mask and my microphone outside the mask, this little, you know, it was like, <laughs> and they couldn't, they couldn't even tell who it was because I had a full head mask and everybody got up and started like the running toward the door almost, you know, like some maniac just took over. What did he do to the pastor? He took over the stage and he's going, <laughs> here's the thing. Some of you are kind of like, it's kind of like that with your, Marriage, it's like you're talking, but you're not talking. And you're going to have to pull the mask off. And you're going to have to say, this is the real me. I, I, I pulled the mask off really quick. No, it's me, your pastor. Everything's okay, you know. But you're going to have to go deeper. But that's going to be hard because you've worn that. Mask is pretty fixed. You almost feel like it's part of you. Slip in a little bit this morning already. So here's the thing. At Community of Faith, we already know. We already know. And we love you just like you are. It's a safe place. You can let the mask go. It's all right. It's all right to do it here. You don't have to hold it in place anymore. It's a lot of work to do. Let's return to husband and wife and see how they do this next part. What do you need from me right now? What do I need from you right now? The counselor says, what do you need from your wife right now to feel more, as you put it, safe and sure. What do you long for? Can you tell her exactly what you need from her? And the husband says this, I get crazy paralyzed when I feel unable to please you. I, I know I shut down, but I don't want to do that anymore. I don't know how to be close. I, I don't even know what being close really looks like. I've never done that before. I can't do it. I mean, I do, I, all I ever do is say, do you want to have sex? That's not the same thing, is it? The wife emphatically, no, not the same thing. 
I know I've neglected you. I know I've let you down. I get so caught up in proving myself at work and to you. Then when I hear you're angry in spite of all my efforts, it just kills me. I want us to be together. I need you. I want you to give me a chance here. Stop watching for the slip up and to hear that you're very important to me. I want us to be together. I don't always know how to do it. And it's almost suddenly as if he realizes the risk he's taken. He begins to wipe his hands on his jeans and he says to the counselor, I've never done this before. This is not near as fun as I thought it might be. Wife's eyes go wide and she begins to cry. Husband has become accessible. He can tell his wife about his attachment needs and vulnerabilities. He's emotionally engaged. It's this that matters. Guys, if we could understand this, this is what your wife longs for. Not for you to fix it. When she comes to you with something and you start saying, well, one, two, three, four, five, here's, you haven't done that yet, so don't come back to me till you figure that out, right? The neuroscience of connection. Scientists have discovered how God created us. He gave us these mirror neurons. They're, they're in our, our prefrontal cortex, and, and it, they start to buzz when you get down to this kind of a level. When you get the elevator down to the bottom floor, when you begin to connect like that. And it's these neurons, scientists tell us, that cause us to be able to feel what another person is feeling, to know, and not just intellectually anymore, to actually know it. They discovered it in the 90s by accident. A, a, a researcher had all of this electrical stuff on the monkey's brain, and the monkey's watching, and the researcher's eating an ice cream cone, and the monkey's brain lights up like he's eating the ice cream cone. And that's where they began to discover some of this. But so when we say, do you, I need to feel known. I need you to feel what I'm, t I mean, we mean that. That's what the mirror neurons do. It's this feeling heard, feeling known. Attachment responses are wired in by God. Guys, you might think I'm not good at it, but think about how you do with the kids. Now, some of you, you just aren't good at at it because you haven't had any chance to practice. But sometimes when it's safe for some of us, we are good. I talk to some of you and, and you say with my kids, I'm, you know, my daughter comes home from school and I say, how was your day? I try to connect. I come home from work, you know, and I sit down with her and try to spend some quality time looking her in the face. I, at night, tell her stories and listen to her. We laugh together. You know how to connect when it's safe. And so we've got to learn how to do that with each other. The wife, she doesn't really know how to respond. She says, it's such a risk like leaping from a great height and hoping that you'll catch me to her husband. I, I've built up so much distrust. Husband responds, just ask me, I'm here. She replies, I need your reassurance. I need your attention. I need to know that I come first, even if it's just for a few minutes. Can you just hold me? And he stands up and he moves over beside her and he just holds her. The mirror neurons are vibrating like crazy. See, this is what God has for us. This is what he wants for us. And that's called abundant life. He wants us to understand and to have that. But the emotional bond that I'm talking about here is something that many couples have never experienced. And here's the thing. Hold me tight is about getting intimate, knowing and walking together. But if you think that hold me tight is about your significant other meeting every need of your heart now that you've gotten there, you're going to be disillusioned. So Laura's going to talk about that. And we're going to figure this out, and we're going to see what God has for us here. Just like Mark said, so often in relationships, we look to one another to meet our needs. And I'm, God certainly will use your partner to meet some of your needs. But it's so important that we don't get that confused. We need to have our expectations set right. Sometimes we need to realign them because we get to thinking that our spouse is going to meet every need that we have. It's important, like Mark said, to identify and communicate those needs with one another. But then we have to look to the right place. We have to look to the right place to get those needs met. I want you to listen to Jeremiah 2, 13. 
says, my people have committed a double wrong. They have rejected me, the fountain of giving life-giving water, and they have dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns, which cannot even hold water. Yes, we're learning to connect with one another better on an emotional level, but that's what it is. It's connection that produces intimacy. It lets you know one another. It's knowing and understanding your partner's deepest fears and needs. It's being there for them in the midst of all of it. But your partner can't fulfill them. And if you're looking to them to do that, you're going to continue to be disappointed and disillusioned. You have to look to the right place. God said, I am the fountain of living water. That's where we're supposed to go with those needs. I want you to imagine Niagara Falls. Maybe you've been there and actually seen it in person, but hold that picture in your mind. It it has the highest flow rate of any waterfall on earth. Some places have a vertical drop of 176 feet. Every second, 700,000 gallons of water go over the falls. It would actually take the average household in Houston seven and a half years to use the amount of water that goes over in one second of Niagara Falls. So picture that in your mind. Now I want you to imagine your three-year-old self in the backyard, digging a mud hole and pouring water in it. That's the picture of this verse. That's what it's saying. When we seek from one another the things that only God can provide for us, it's like we're digging in the mud hole, trying to get it to hold water in the backyard. And God's saying, I'm here for you. I'm the fountain of living water. I'm available to you. Don't look in the wrong place. And did you see what it said? We're putting water in cracked cisterns. They leak. They don't even hold water. They can't hold water. If I put my hope in Mark, if I'm looking to him to meet every need that I have, I'm going to be disillusioned. It's just a matter of time. And no matter how great Mark is, he may be the best husband in the world, and I think that he is. He's cracked. He's leaks, guys. Oh. (laughs) He can't hold water. It's no wonder. (laughs) It's no wonder we're parched. We're looking to have all those needs met and we're looking to one another and we can't do it. And that's why you feel like you failed. That's why you feel that pressure. That's why you shut down and withdraw and keep pursuing and trying to get your needs met because we're going to the wrong place. We have to go to the fountain of living water. That's where it all starts. Look at Psalm 73, 26. My flesh and heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Psalm 23 was written by a man named Asaph. The word used here for flesh means near kinsman. So he was likely talking about someone who was related to him, the closest people to him, maybe someone of his own flesh. And he's saying, even those closest to me may fail. And I think he was probably saying, those closest to me have failed. And he says, even my own heart has failed. He's asking, really, who or what can I trust? I can't trust those people closest to me. I can't trust even my own heart. But then listen to what he said. God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That word there in Hebrew for God is Elohim. It means the strong and mighty one. It's the same word used in the very first word of the Bible. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The creator of the universe, the one who made me in the first place, he can be trusted. He's the only one. Everyone else will fail you. Asaph was a Levite, and when God divided the promised land among the tribes of Israel, he divided it among 11 tribes, and the 12th tribe was the Levites. They were the ones set aside to be priests, and Asaph was part of that tribe. And God said, I'm not going to give you a portion of the land because I am going to be your portion. I am going to be what you need. So this verse is written from that knowledge, the knowledge of a Levite saying, God is my portion. It's one thing to have God as your refuge, but it's everything for him to be your portion. Every need met, every longing fulfilled, every fear relieved. He's the fountain of living water. 
It says, come to me to have those needs met. Lamentations 3, 22 and 20, through 24 says, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will have hope in him. Because you have your hope in him, you can work out your relationship. You can have those attachment needs met, that connection that you long for from one another. Maybe your deepest fear today is that you are alone or you will be alone. Maybe you feel alone even in your marriage. Maybe your partner isn't willing or able to connect with you on an emotional level. Maybe you're divorced. Maybe you're single. But are you alone? Listen to what God said. For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. You're not alone. You're never alone. Maybe you're petrified at the thought of being weak, that being perceived as weak, or someone's going to discover that you really don't have it all together, and you're wondering if your weaknesses make you disqualified for life. Listen to what God says to you today. I am with you. That is all you need. My power shows up best in weak people. You can relax. You can be who you are. God has it. Maybe your deepest fear is that you're not good enough somehow. You can't measure up. And you need to know that you're sufficient. Listen to the fountain of life. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You are perfectly designed just like you are. You are good. You are sufficient. Maybe your greatest heartache is that you feel like you've failed. Maybe you feel ashamed or guilty and you need to know that there's hope for you today. Listen to God's words to you. Those who wait for me shall never be ashamed. I made you and I will not forget to help you. I've blotted out your sins. They are gone like morning mist at noon. Oh, return to me for I have paid the price to set you free. It couldn't be clearer You can let go of the shame. You can let go of the guilt. You're not a failure. If you're looking to anyone else to meet those needs, I can guarantee you that you're going to be disappointed and disillusioned. But if you bring them to the one who created you, the fountain of life, you're going to find that he's all you need. Every need met. And then you're free to relate and connect with that person you love the most. You have that position of security, that foundation that allows you to build those connections. You know, in the Garden of Eden, Adam was there in the very beginning and he walked with God in the cool of the day. And God and Adam, they had everything. Adam, all of his needs were met by God. And Adam was happy. And Adam was walking. And then God looked and God said something really interesting. It's not good that man should be alone. I will make, and in the Hebrew, an ezer konegdo to walk along beside. And ezer konegdo simply means the one to walk with, the one to walk along with. You see what hold me tight is all about? It's understanding that we don't have to be alone. And it might not even be a spouse. It might be a close friend. It might be Uh, someone that you care about, a relative, a mom or dad. You can go deeper. You can walk with them. Don't look to them to meet your needs, but they get to walk with you through the pain of this life. That's what abundant life for the believer looks like. Looking to our Father to meet every need and having someone, Ezer Konegdo, to walk through life with in the deepest parts, to really know us. It's going to take a lot of faith. It's going to take a lot of courage. I want to encourage you to sign up for the conference because you're going to go deeper there. We've had a little bit of a slow sign up. I think a little bit, we're kind of scared. It's okay. You know, how deep are we really going to go? Go ahead and sign up. I want you to go for it, all right? That's what we do at Community of Faith. We'll go for it, all right? You can sign up in the lobby right now. I want you just to close your eyes. 
your father's here. Maybe you're at a place in your life where you don't have that Ezer Conegdo right now. He says, just look to me. I'll be sufficient. At the right time, I'll provide. Trust him. Trust his heart. Maybe you just need to confess to him you've been trying to look to all these other things to fulfill you, whether it's at your work and, or it's trying to get money or it's you know, all the things the world tries to tell us. There's so many different things. Maybe you've been trying to get it in a relationship that you know isn't his plan for you. Right now, would you just tell him, I'm going to look to you to meet my needs. And then would you just tell him, I'm going to have the courage. I'm going to have the courage to go deep. I'm going to go to the bottom floor. I'm going to be known and fully know. I'm asking you to do that, God. I'm asking you to do that for me. Father, I do ask that for everyone within the sound of my voice. Come, kingdom of God, upon us. Bring that abundant life that you long for us to experience. God, most of us, many of us, we've never walked that way with anyone. Most of us have been looking to others to meet our needs, and we've been so disillusioned. We want to start looking to you, and we want to have that walk. Someone that knows us, that can walk with us, that to be fully known and to fully know with another human being. God, I just ask that for each and every one of us here. And I ask that you would fulfill it. It's gonna take a miracle for a lot of us, but I'm, that's what you do, you do miracles. So do it in Jesus' name, amen.